If you're looking for a cheap B650 motherboard, then today I'm holding in my hand two of the cheapest boards you can get. And even right now on AliExpress, you can get these boards for under $100. However, I also picked them up on a sale, which AliExpress has actually been having quite a few sales in the last few months, to the point where it can bring prices of things like these motherboards and CPUs down to extremely low levels. But at the prices I paid for both these boards, I just couldn't help myself. I had to try them. And this may sound a bit crazy, but this board in particular I'm holding in my hands, this B650i from a brand called Jingyu, is not only an ITX motherboard, but it's also posting out some incredible numbers to the point where my jaw was dropping while I was doing some of my tests here today. But let's get on with this review on both of these boards, which I'll combine into one video, because you may be used to just seeing motherboards from the typical big four. That's ASRock, MSI, Gigabyte, and ASUS. But brands like Jingyu got into the scene, sort of starting out with older chipsets and then using those older chipsets to get experience, make cheaper boards for like things like used Xeons. And over the years, I think they're now come to the point where they're ready to compete with the big four. But let's split this review into two sections because we're gonna get over the best board first, which just blew me away in terms of testing it out both with a Ryzen 7 7800X 3D and also a Ryzen 9 7950X. So one of them can go really hungry for power. The other is the most popular gaming CPU. So in terms of the B650i, this Jingyu Night Devil, I think it's called, it was scoring some really impressive numbers in Cinebench, but also when I did my gaming benchmark results here, comparing it against what I would have on the B650e Taichi Lite, which is one of the best boards you can get for your money, especially if you're looking for value on the higher end of things, this board delivered some slightly better gaming numbers, which was more consistent. Now you may be stopping me and going, why is that, Brian? Why are the numbers on this board some of the best you've seen? And that's because it's actually, I put it down to ITX where the traces between the memory and the CPU, for instance, are shorter than a lot of other boards. So that can slightly help performance and that's where you get your performance bumps from, believe it or not. So gaming numbers, really impressive. When we move over to the onboard audio, which I do like to test with, especially cheaper boards, to know, hey, can I plug some cheap headphones into them? Will I get okay sound? This is where the numbers were really impressive. Only a minus 4.5 decibel roll off from zero to 20 Hertz. Then after that, extremely flat and for crosstalk we're talking minus 81 db and low distortion as well so overall really good onboard audio then you get a 2.5 gigabit ethernet and you've also got optical out so if you want to plug in like i do a 5.1 digital surround sound you can do that off this board then there's even better news and that is the tuning right you think with a cheaper board like this you're not going to be able to get your memory speeds up high enough or your latency is low enough and this is where the 7800X 3D and the 7950X, and we're gonna make a point with both these CPUs because the next board that we're gonna check out does differ a little bit here. We are able to get our 6200 megahertz CL28 timings to work on this board, absolutely no problems with both these CPUs. And this is where we'll start to get into the nuances though, because you may be looking at a BIOS screen right now, and here is where you can change this board from Chinese to English but then the top menus still stay the same. And overall, the BIOS is probably one of the biggest letdowns on this board. It's just kind of hard to navigate versus the other boards that I've tried, at least on AM5. And here is where going into the BIOS, if you wanna unlock your Expos, for example, and even raise your memory speeds, you then gotta go into a menu, unlock the activate thing, and then unlock the Expo, and then <laughs> click another button again. And it's a little bit confusing, but overall, if you spend a little bit of time on it, you can get all the settings you need to unlock and tune it just right and then exit the BIOS. Because me personally, once I'm done with a rig and I've tuned it up, especially if it's my personal rig, I don't spend a whole lot of extra time in the BIOS. So that's probably one of the most annoying things, though let's look at another annoying thing with this board, and that is because it's an ITX board, it's just got little room to install proper brackets off for your water cooler or say your air cooler. And here's where I had problems mounting the Arctic 420 water cooler where I had to actually put the bracket underneath the heat sink a little bit and over the inductor, which is a little bit risky. You don't really wanna do this, 
but I just wanted to test the board out. So do be aware that it is a tight fit for a lot of coolers on this particular motherboard. Then there's the last down and that's there's no Wi-Fi included, but they do give you the bracket and you can install it yourself, especially if you've got some of these little Wi-Fi cards running around. You've got the antenna here, so that's gonna save you a little bit of money, especially if you're like me and you pick up some of these old Wi-Fi cards out of old dead laptops. Though looking at the back, you've got 2.5 gigabit ethernet, you've got type C, type, five type A's, and you've got that optical hour, as we said before, but then you've got a heat sink slotted M.2 on the front, which actually gave out some pretty impressive temperatures. So it is a bit of a chunky one. It should be able to support a Gen 5, though you may need some active cooling, which we'll get onto later with the 7950X. Then on the back, you've got the M.2 slot, an additional one, as well as having a type C out. Though let's move over now to the, I guess, sort of mediocre news with this, and that's with the 7950X. This is where we're trying the big daddy, the, uh, power drainer here, especially out of the box. This thing can use up to around 230 watts from memory. And here is where the power readings, when I'm doing my testing here, are a little bit off. The direct power readings are saying it's only using like 58 watts in Cinebench for the 7800X3D. And then for this, it's saying the power watts were under 200 watts. And I, especially when we're looking at from the wall figures, we're using over 340 watts here. So those power numbers that are spitting out in hardware info, a little bit inaccurate. I definitely feel that is the case here, but this is where we tested out the 7950X here on this board after 20 minutes. And here's where we got some interesting results at 25 degrees ambient temperatures. We managed to, the VRM did go up to on the heat sink 44 degrees, but then the actual MOSFETs went up to 97 degrees. So you're starting to get very toasty with this 7950X. And we did put a fan on it, but the problem here is if you put a fan over the VRM, it's only gonna cool one side of it. So underneath this heat sink, which is sort of sealed off here, that's where it started getting over 90 degrees as well. So you can direct some airflow in there somehow, but it's a little bit tricky. Do keep that in mind if you wanna use a say a 16 core with this motherboard, I'd recommend actually tuning it down to say 150 watts with the 7950X, you can do that to around 4.8 gigahertz. All cores shouldn't be an issue, but overall, the memory tuning on this thing, that 6200 megahertz CL28 timings, I'm able to lock that in, and then the results in terms of Cinebench and the gaming benchmarks, not just with the 7800X 3D, but also the 7950X, were the most impressive I've seen. And actually, for an upcoming review, which I've already done the results for the 9950X versus the 7950X, we did all that on the B650 Taiji, so we're gonna keep these results sort of out of that review because it's all been sandboxed on a B650 Taichi, for instance. So ultimately with this board, before we get onto the Maxon, absolutely blown away by the performance figures. The nuances are there, but definitely under 100 USD, considering the chipset cost of a B650, which is around $40, that means 60 bucks for the whole motherboard. It's just how, it is mind blowing how much value you're getting out of this thing at this price. So that one definitely is a winner, especially as well since ITX motherboards do cost a lot of money, typically because they're harder to design and they use more high quality components on board. This one really just makes it an absolute win. Anyhow, let's move on now to the Max Sun, and I've saved the worst till last, but I shouldn't say worst because this board actually is impressive. I, I was looking at this thing, I was going, wow, this is gonna get a good review, but then I tested the uh, Jingyu second, and that was even more impressive. So we've got, what we've got here is a really solid board where the 7800X3D, mounting this with this motherboard, it was in a 22 ambient environment. I woke up really early to start the testing here, and I obviously I'm not turning my heater on because I don't need it at 22C. So the ambits will be a little bit different here for the tests, and if we delta adjust them, it'll be a little bit hotter than the Jingyu with the 7800X3D. But ultimately here we're looking at 36 on the heatsink, 50 on the MOSFETs. So with the 7800X3D, absolutely fine in terms of temperatures running Cinebench. The scores were absolutely fine too, just a little bit slower than that Jingyu. And this is where we were able to, in the BIOS, lock in the 6,000 megahertz and then going up to 6,200 CL28 timing. So able to do that sweet spot tune as well as the Infinity Fabric. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Infinity Fabric at 2067 on both these boards on all the CPUs. 
But here is where we started to come into issues on the 7950X. I couldn't get it to boot with 6200 megahertz CL28. So slightly inferior design in terms of the traces or maybe the memory dims or just in general could be the PCB layers in terms of the implementation of the DDR5 slots to the CPU itself, a little bit inferior to the Jingyu and of course, boards like the B650E Tai Chi. But then we're going into the BIOS itself, a little bit more polished than the Jingyu. Definitely could find my settings easier here, easier place to navigate, locked in all my settings a lot quicker than I could in the B650i Night Devil, for instance. But you've also got Wi-Fi included on this motherboard in particular. So that's included from the get-go. And also the PCB is nice and thick, just like the ITX solution here, but you don't get a Type-C out and you don't get a RGB connectors which you do get on the ITX motherboard. Though going over to the rear, you also don't get a type C and you only get a standard NIC on the back, but you do get a clear CMOS button, but no SPDIF optical out and six USB ports type A's to boot there. Also, there's a singular M.2 slot here, no heatsink included too. So if you are getting a gen four or gen five drive, you will need to bring your own heatsink to the table. But here is where if we move over now to the 7950X, the VRM test, right? So we've done the tests on the 7800X 3D, the gaming numbers are fine, not as good as the B650E Tai Chi or the ITX solution, but still solid, really solid experience all around with the 7800X 3D. I think you can't go wrong there if you're gonna buy that sort of setup with this board or if you're gonna buy six cores or other CPUs that are under 100 watts. But here's where if we go to 7950X, it caps the wattage here at 130-ish watts. So from the get-go, we can't go over that level. And here's where we ran the tests for the 7950X, and we we're getting Cinebench score of around 34,000 points. So you're definitely leaving a bit of performance on the table there versus, say, the ITX solution or other motherboards that don't have that problem. But here is where, at these particular settings, the temperatures were not an issue. I think we were seeing a little bit above 60 degrees or so on the MOSFETs. So again, it's gonna be absolutely fine. It's just that they're protecting the board with conservative settings because it'll quickly go up to that sort of 90 degree, 100 degree region if we start to go close to say 200 watts. So in other words, it's not really suited for the higher performing, higher power hungry CPUs. So the final thing to go over with the Max on board here is that onboard audio pretty much almost identical to the Night Devil. I think there was a little bit slightly higher uh, roll off, minus 5.5 decibels versus minus 4.5. And also if we zoom in to the lines themselves, there's a little bit more shake in the frequency response, meaning it's just not as good as the Night Devil, but still really good in general, low distortion. So if you're plugging in a cheap pair of cans, you're gonna have a good time on these uh, onboard audio. You're not gonna really come into any surprises in terms of harsh notes coming out of nowhere, which in the past I have tested onboard audio that has done that. It's been absolutely horrendous. So both the onboard audio solutions here are fine for your cheap headphones or your mid-range cans. They're around a hundred bucks, sort of value things like that. And with all that out of the way, it's time to sum up these motherboards here. And I am blown away by this board in particular. This is really good, except for the nuances. Keep that in mind. Remember those nuances we talked about? The water cooler had a tough fit, a very sort of unorthodox fit there, as well as the BIOS being a little bit difficult to navigate and no Wi-Fi included except for the bracket itself. And that Wi-Fi card is almost went flying, <laughs> but it didn't. And then we've got the Challenger here, which is kind of like the polished package. You do get the IO shield included too. You got the Wi-Fi pre-installed. The performance is slightly inferior to the other two boards here that we talked about in today's review. And the memory speeds overall, if you're getting 6,000 XMP profile memory and a 7800X3D, it's gonna serve you really well out of the box. You're gonna have no issues on in terms of VRM temperatures or anything like that. But if you do wanna step it up to a higher end CPU, you are gonna get some issues there in terms of performance and it's gonna be capped at 130 watts. Also on that note, another nuance is of course the 7950X on the ITX board. Do keep in mind, it is going to need some sort of VRM cooling once you go above 200 watts. That'd be my recommendation. I mean, you don't have to put VRM cooling on, but if ambient temperatures creep up, say to 30 degrees, things can get out of control very quickly. And then you could experience things like thermal throttling 
and it's just not a pleasant experience, as well as the hotter the temperatures, the less life your components are gonna have, especially once we move above 80 degrees. That's generally what I've found in my experience. Anyhow, guys, under 100 bucks, you may see me using this thing quite a bit more. Don't be surprised if it becomes my new benchmark gaming test system because of having some of that FPS figures that were actually really impressive. Or I might just use, say, an ASRock ITX board because ITX boards, one thing that came out of this review for me personally, because I've been doing a lot of apples to apples comparisons, is you can eke out a little bit of extra performance with the ITX boards. And so it was good to see that. And definitely when it comes to gaming performance, this thing is giving no compromises. So really impressive results. Anyhow, guys, I'll put some links in the description below if you wanna check them out. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button. And also if you have any questions or comments, be sure to go at it down below. And with that aside, I'll catch you guys in some more content very soon. I am testing that Ryzen 5000 that you guys have requested in the comments. I've been doing the Windows 10 versus Windows 11 stuff for you, as well as some power profile stuff, which I've also got some very interesting results there. So do stay tuned for those videos. And with that all aside, I'll catch you in the next one very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.